The Apocalypse, Part 1. Now, the word apocalypse has come to sound so sinister. Most people think of terrible creatures, fiery lakes, 666, Armageddon and the Antichrist and so on. But the word apocalypse means revelation or unveiling. It's the name given to the final book in the Bible. And the word refers to the unveiling of God's eternal purpose, which will be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, it's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. It's not the end of the world as such, but the end of man's corrupt governance of the world and the beginning of the reign of King Jesus. That can't be bad. And so the book begins. Chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear witness of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So, right at the beginning, we learn that this message is so important that the transmission is fourfold. It comes from the Father, given to the Son, given to the angel, given to John, who writes it down for us to read. This is an important message. And it will concern the fulfilment of God's eternal purpose, a plan that is cosmic in terms of time, because it's eternal. And it's cosmic in terms of matter, because it includes everything in the heavens and everything on earth. Now, to set the stage, I've got to read to you some verses from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, beginning in verse 7 of chapter 1. Just listen to these magnificent, wonderful words. In him, that is to say, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Hallelujah. Christians are saved, eternally secure. We were saved from our sins and from the penalty that our sins incurred. But the passage goes on to tell us that this is just the beginning, that we've been saved from our sins for something. And it's huge, it's cosmic. It goes on to say, verse 9, Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. Through Jesus, the unity of heaven and earth will one day be restored. And I say restored because once there was unity, but it was broken. There was unity when one perfect will held it all together. That one perfect will was, of course, God Almighty's perfect will. Then Satan introduced a second will into the universe in opposition to God's. And thus he broke the unity. He fractured creation. After man's creation, Satan hoped to enlist him, this new creation, in his service, and so caused him also to rebel. But instead of man submitting his will to Satan, which Satan had hoped, he became a will of his own, and in time there were millions of conflicting wills in creation, shattering everything even further into millions of pieces. Then, God sent forth his son, the vital step in a plan to restore the original unity. He will bring everything under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Ephesians again, verse 10. At the end of time, he will gather together in one all things in Christ, things in heaven and on earth in him. The theme of the book of Revelation may involve all of those fiery judgments which are always connected with it. But its purpose is the unveiling of a glory, a glory not seen since before Satan rebelled, a glorious unity, togetherness, wholeness, a shalom. Therefore, it is the revelation 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. The slain and resurrected lamb is central and his enthronement as the lion is inevitable. But without his sufferings, the eternal purpose could never be realised. In chapter 5, verse 5 of this book, the lamb who has suffered is the only one who can open the scroll that will complete world history and so fulfil the eternal purpose. He's the only one. Because he had entered history, he had become a man, and he had suffered as a man. Yisurim Shel Ahava, the sufferings of love. Without those sufferings, there could be no opening of the scroll, there could be no final end, completion to man's history and to the realising of God's eternal purpose. Without the Lamb, there could be no lion ruling on this earth. And both appear in this book, and both are two aspects of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. This is his revelation. No wonder then that there is a blessing on anyone reading, hearing, doing the words of the revelation. As the next verse says, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. And now John begins his book in earnest. Verse four, John to the seven churches which are in Asia Grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the sevenfold spirit which is before his throne. Don't you just love the way John rapture, rhapsodizes about Jesus right at the very beginning? He doesn't need to warm up. He gets straight into the subject. You imagine beginning to write a letter, and straight away you just cannot restrain yourself from rhapsodizing about Jesus. Straight away he goes into it. But note the seven, the seven churches, there's the sevenfold spirit. As in the book of Genesis, seven is central in this book also. One of the greatest power numbers in Judaism is seven, and it represents creation, completion and blessing. This last book that completes ties up with the first one that was about creation. And the number seven is creation, completion and blessing. It completes history, this book does, and it describes the blessing that God has in store for us and always had in store for us. But all is dependent upon Jesus. And so John continues, verse five. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. John is overflowing with his message. Apocalypse, you know, is great news for those who love Jesus. He makes them kings and priests. But for those who have rejected Jesus, it's terrible news. The worst scenario that they could imagine. What will be? What is a dream to us? becomes a nightmare for them. Goes on to say, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, Amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, which is to come, the Almighty. He is the beginning and the end. History is his story. It always was, it always shall be. Through all the migrations and world wars, the farming and building and exploring, God was fulfilling his eternal purpose. Everything moved towards that end. And God's involvement in the final mayhem of this world is guaranteed and is stunning. Verse nine, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. You know, they can imprison a Christian geographically, but not spiritually. John's spirit is as free as a bird, he goes on to say. 
I was in the spirit in the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. John's senses are heightened. God has done it. And John can hear things that nobody else can hear. You know, before the fall in the Garden of Eden, they heard the sound of God's voice walking in the garden. Their senses were heightened and God wasn't hidden then in the way that he is hidden at present. At Mount Sinai, they saw the thunder or the voices, Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet. Fascinating verse, actually. They saw the thunder. They saw the voices. God had heightened their senses in some way. And what did John hear? Verse 11. The voice said this. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like unto a son, the son of man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the chest with a golden girdle. There's a wonderful simplicity about this garment. This is, of course, Jesus, but John doesn't know that. His garments are the garments of the Kohen Gadol, the high priest of Israel. You know, Jesus came as prophet when he was Jesus of Nazareth. And now he is in the role of priest. After his ascension, he went back to the father and he's in the role of priest. And that is how John sees him here. And, and he walks among the lampstands, the seven lampstands, and he's, 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 he's working as a priest, as the high priest of the church. But by the end of this book, we see him as king. Hallelujah. Goes on to say, verse 14, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. You know, it's been said that the eyes are the windows of the soul. And surely this flame of fire in the eyes of Jesus is the fire of love unquenchable and righteousness uncompromising. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. No wonder. But Jesus goes on to do and say something very beautiful. Of all the memorable things in this book, this ranks as one of the highest and most significant. John says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me. He didn't need to do that. He could have raised John to his feet with a mere word, but we may be reminded that he could have healed the leper with a word, but he didn't. He reached his hand out to that untouchable leper and he, he healed him with his hand. It's an act of inherent compassion, empathy, the spontaneous act of the loving Son of God. You see, God is spirit. He has no body. He is spirit. But he became flesh in Jesus and now he has a hand and with that hand he reaches out to us he reached out to the leper he reaches out here to john he reaches out to us the spirit became flesh and touched us the most profound and unique fact about christianity no other religion has got a god who became man had a hand that could touch us aren't you glad that the word became flesh, that God became man. The God of philosophy and all other religions would never, ever reach out and touch us with a human hand. And furthermore, 
one with the scars of love. Now we could stop right here and not read any more because this one scene is the sweetest of all, but we must go on. He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive for evermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Now may I take the liberty of rephrasing this. Jesus was, seems to me to be saying something like this. I am the one you knew and loved, the same one who was crucified and rose from the dead. He's sort of saying, I am Jesus. We fished together on the Sea of Galilee. You saw my empty tomb. We shared meals together. We laughed together. We cried together. We prayed together. It's me, Jesus. You know, Jesus will be absolutely glorified. Yet in his, the majesty of his glory, the resplendence of his glory, he will forfeit none of his humanity. I like to think that when Jesus sits at the head of the table at the wedding feast, there will be a moment when he looks over at me with recognition and love and understanding. Let's go on. Verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which thou sawest are the seven churches. So the book will subdivide into three. Things that John sees, things which are and things which shall be in the future. The first section, the things that John sees, has just concluded. It runs from verse 9 to verse 20 of chapter 1. The second section runs throughout the next two chapters, the things which are, they are the messages to the churches. They are addressed to seven actual churches that existed at John's time in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. And so to John, they are the things that are. But there are three ways of interpreting them. One, they are actual churches, as I said. Two, they're descriptions of churches that exist in every age. That all churches resemble one or two of those churches. The characteristics of a local church will be like Ephesus or like Pergamum or like Laodicea, whatever. Thirdly, they describe seven overlapping periods of church history from AD 30 when Jesus ascended or thereabouts AD 30 to the rapture of the church. So the entire church age is, con is contained within these seven messages. It's a fascinating study. Now, we shan't deal with the messages in detail. We'll jump straight into the third section, the things that shall be in the future. But this is how they fit in with history. I'll skim through it fast. The first message is to Ephesus. Now, Ephesus means not lasting. And that covers history from AD 30 to AD 100. The first love of the church wasn't lasting. The second message was to Smyrna, which name means anointed for burial. It comes from the word myrrh, which was used to anoint dead bodies. That covers history from 100 to 313, the terrible period of Roman persecution. Hence Smyrna anointed for burial. The third message to Pergamum, which means divorced. This covers from 313 to 600. It's the period when Imperial Rome controlled the papacy and many pagan doctrines and practices were introduced, divorcing the name Pergamum, divorcing the church from its Hebrew beginnings. The fourth message was to Thyatira, meaning continuing sacrifice from 600 to 1517, when the mass or daily re-crucifying of Christ was almost universally offered until the Protestant Reformation in the time of Luther. The fifth message, Sardis, 
means fleshy or incomplete. It's linked with the word sarx, which is flesh. From 1517 to 1648, the peace of Westphalia. Protestantism, you see, threw out most of the pagan doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church, but unfortunately retained a link between church and state, which it should have done away with. The Reformation, therefore, was incomplete or of the flesh. The sixth message was to Philadelphia, which means brotherly love, from 1648 to 1900, from Westphalia to the apostasy. This was the greatest period of missionary activity since the Acts of the Apostles. And the final message, the seventh message, was to Laodicea, which means rule of the people, from 1900 to the present day, characterised by the multiplying of sects and cults. Now we have the benefit of hindsight and can see how they fit the progress of history during the past two millennia. But of course to John, these messages were directly intended for the seven churches of Asia Minor. This therefore is John reporting on the things which are. There's one section remaining, the things that shall be in the future and that takes up the rest of the book. The next video concerns the throne of God.